So I'm I'm Abhishek and I'll be presenting today about approaching machine learning problems. So I'll keep it quite general. First, who am I? I'm Abhishek. But uh, I work as Chief Data Scientist at Boost AI, which is a Norwegian company and uh, where I help build virtual assistants. Um, yeah, I was at some point I was uh, number three on Kaggle. Uh, then I quit, got a job. <laughs> now I'm back. So this is the company I work for, and uh, this is my Kaggle profile. So I didn't I didn't do much in last one one and a half years. Uh, that's why my rank has gone down. So. Uh, the agent of our today's talk would be to see what the different types of machine learning problems are. I think everyone is talking about that. We'll go through some evaluation metrics and cross-validation. Uh, we'll also look at uh, categorical data handling, numeric data and text data, and no image data. But we'll take a look at the hyperparameter tuning. And I think that's basically it. Let's get it. You don't need anything more than that, right? For machine learning problems. So, to start with, like simple, basic supervised versus unsupervised classification. But just a show of hands, how many of you are beginners? Quite few. So, I'll, I'll just go through this uh, very quickly. So, supervised problem is considered to be easier to tackle than an unsupervised problem. In the supervised problem, you have the target variable. So, you have the features and for every sample, you have a target. And it's not like that when you have unsupervised data. So, if you have data without the target variables, you cluster them uh, so like for a for example a fraud detection problem when you don't have when you don't know which transactions are fraud that becomes an unsupervised problem uh, when we look at classification or regression classification is about predicting a class discrete and regression is quantity predicting a value continuous um, so we have different types of machine learning problems, so single value, single column, binary values. So in that classification problem, one sample belongs to only one class, there are two classes. You can have real values, which is regression, or multiple binary columns, or you can just have multiple columns for regression. And there's also multi-instance, multi-label problems. Um, yeah, so one sample can belong to several classes. Um, yeah, I think uh, now we can move to evaluation metrics a little bit. So if I'm going too fast, just raise your hand. Don't ask me now. Uh, we have different types of evaluation metrics. Accuracy, AUC, um, absolute error, RMSE, log loss, and there can be many more. And Sometimes people confuse which one to use where. So what I think is like, if you have a classification problem, probably it's easier if we just go through these four metrics. AUC is area under curve, accuracy everyone knows, log loss is Kaggle's favorite these days, and F1 is based on precision and recall. And similarly for a regression problem, I think these three metrics make sense. So this is like quite general and it's my opinion. Uh, it can vary. So when we, I wanted to make this presentation a little bit interactive, but that's not possible. <laughs> so uh, when we look at this data, we have, we can see like there are five, five variables. And uh, when, 
I love pandas, so we'll be doing most of the stuff in pandas. So when we look at the first variable, the value counts, we see like there are a lot of ones, but very less number of zeros. So it looks like it's a target variable, and it is actually. Uh, the second one, uh, var one. When we look at it, we see like uh, there are several values which are repeated a number of times. And if, if you're not if you're not provided with like what kind of variable it is, so to me it looks like categorical. I think to most of you too. I'll just assume. So to handle categorical features, uh, we can have either no pre-processing. So if it's just integers, so just feed it in random forest or XGBoost, and you can do frequency encoding. So you can replace every variable by the number of times it appears in that column. You can do one-hot encoding and label encoding. So label encoding is something like if your categories are strings, every string maps to one integer. But how would you go with handling rare values? So here you can see like in the same column from previous slide, we have some categories which are seen only one time or less than 100 times let's say. So what you can do is just take everything which is seen more than 100 times and okay so okay I see like there is a slight mistake here uh, but what I'm trying to do here is take everything which is seen less than 100 times and put it in its own category and call it a rare category. Um, so like that's one one of the one of the few tricks to handle these kind of rare data and it's actually better if you just combine train and test data before doing this uh, another type of data is uh, a mixture so you can see like the first two columns are categorical others are numerics so to handle any kind of data like, like this one, we build a pipeline. We have to read the data obviously. And I like pandas. Then you have the categorical features. For categorical features, you can go for one hot encoding. So you can, I'm using scikit-learn. And you can specify like uh, var1 or var2, which vars are categorical. Oh no, no, oh yeah, yeah, you can. And then you have the transform data for that. And then you have the numerical features uh, for which you don't do anything. You just eliminate target and ID column from the data, attach the categorical features to it, and you're basically done. So now you have everything. So what we did was, uh, since our categorical features are sparse, we are doing one hot encoding on them. We will just use SIP sparse at stack and uh, then you can use any kind of uh, model like random forest or xgboost what you would need to do is it won't work it will throw an error so i will leave it to you to find out what is the error and how to fix it it just requires one small addition a conversion some other type so you have you have the features and then these numerical features can be scaled and there are many different ways to do that so it's standard scaling which is the z-score scaling quite popular or min-max where you uh, transform everything to a minimum and maximum value and there is robust scaling which is something new in scikit-learn or maybe I'm not using it very often so I, I have seen it very recently so it's a scaling method that takes care of outliers. And once you have the scale data, you can use logistic regression, linear regression, or even neural networks. So especially for neural networks, you need to uh, scale the data first, normalize it. Then you have non-scaled, and what works well is XGBoost or LightGBM.
Then we move to a very important step, cross-validation. I think the last talk today is all about cross-validation. So I'm not doing a lot of cross-validation in my presentation. So we, you have different types like K-fold. K-fold is just like splitting into five different folds. Or you have stratified K-fold, which takes care of the target variables. So you supply it with the target variables and then the distribution of target across each folds is the same. Then you have leave one out when you have very less number of samples, like 50, 60 samples. You should go for leave one out. And then you have leave one group out. So let's say you have some categories on which you want to uh, group the folds. So you can use leave one group out. So people call it Lu and logo. Uh, then for regression, you can also use k fold leave one out or leave one group out. There is no stratified. It's not possible. But you can obviously write write something which uh, gives you the same distribution of target in every fold. So that will be kind of stratified. So to put it all together, we start with uh, when we start with machine learning problems, we always are in such a rush we make a Jupyter notebook and then we move cell up cell down we forget everything so it's I like to do it in scripts Jupyter notebook is only for exploration and when you want a reproducible pipeline it's better to use scripts so what I do is I set the random state and number of folds first and then I have a model name which is uh, the script name usually for me with the number of folds. Um, then we have, then then what we do is reading the training and test data, and we obviously drop uh, ID and target columns. And I always keep feature list because if I'm doing some kind of processing on training data here, I have the same order of feature for train and test. So here the feature list uh, that I can use for test data. So I don't mix up the columns. And then converting everything to float. And putting it in uh, stratified K-fold cross-validation. So here the list CLFs is the list of classifiers I have in every fold. These are out of fold predictions and then I have test predictions. Out of fold predictions I have because not in real world but in Kaggle competitions you might want to use them for ensembling stuff later on. And this is the this is the for loop which generates the actual folds. So you can define your model here, and uh, you need to do a model fit and predict on validation and test data both, and it will take care of everything. So right, th this code will only work for if you have one class, two class problem, binary classification kind of problem. Uh, but you can obviously modify it. I'm using ASU here. You can use whatever you want. Um, then what I do is usually save the out of fold predictions, and I also save the script which produced this result. So uh, it's better to do it like the first step when the script starts to just save it there because if you accidentally make some changes, then the script changes. So you have the data, you create features, targets, cross-validation, you have the model. But there's a lot of other things that can be done for categories. So these are all categorical variables that we have seen before. Am I too loud? So these are the categorical variables uh, that uh, we have seen before. And what we can do is we can create a vector for each categories. So creating this vector for each categories is also known as entity embeddings. And how you do that, uh, okay, let's, let's just see this data first. So this is data from one of the recent Kaggle competitions. It's called malware classification. So you have the ID column, the target. Now everything else inside, like engine version, app version, these things can be treated as categorical variables. 
So what we do is like we get the data and I check if it has less than 15,000 unique values. So I just treat it as category. I say that this is a usable column. This is a categorical column column for me. In the next step, uh, I we encode the data. So we can use label encoder, encode it from zero to n, and uh, transform each column to labels. After that, you just create the model, the entity model, and uh, do the split because it's a neural network so I just like to do one single fold and then you have uh, the generator so obviously if your data is huge you need to write some kind of generator here I'm using Keras for everything so you can write your own custom data generator and you need to specify different variables like how many steps you want to do in one epoch and what is the batch size and all that stuff. Batch size can be taken care of in the data generator itself. And that's it. So that's all. That's all. You don't need to do anything else. Just have fun. But this is how you create the model. So uh, you have the embedding layer as a first layer. And you do it for every input of the data frame, every column that you found usable. So after that, it's always a good idea to apply some kind of dropout for regularization. And then I reshape it to the same embedding dimension. So what I'm doing here, the dimension of embedding is chosen such as like the maximum dimension is 50. And uh, otherwise it's number of unique values by two, whatever whatever is the minimum of these. So you can, if you have just three uh, different unique samples, so it will be three embedding size. And then you append everything to the input list. And after that, you can add some dense layers to it. Uh, so the problem we had was binary classification. So I'm just using a, a sigmoid, sigmoid activation. You can also use softmax. And then my inputs here is a list. And this is, it's a list of lists. And this is just a single list, the output. Uh, the data generator looks something like this. So what I've shown here is only for test mode equals false. So when the test mode is true, you don't want to yield uh, the targets you don't have them so what I'm doing here is I'm just creating the number of batches and I do shuffling and then I just choose in that batch size the number of data points the samples I want and I put them as a list of lists and also the target so after this is done the model is ready so that's how you can one of the ways you can handle categorical data so the different points are like you have label encoder one hot binarizer you can convert it to counts you can convert it to embeddings you can create more categories out of the categories you already have and uh, you can also use factorization machines so I'm not going into too much details here but if you have worked with a recommendation system you know how they work it's kind of similar to embeddings uh, for numerical features, you can go for some kind of transformations. So you can add as many transformations as you want. You can go for binning. So here I'm dividing data into every column into 100 bins. And then uh, my new feature is just the bin number. So you can also do the bin number or just the bin count, these kind of things. Uh, Another one is interactions. So you can create a lot of feature interactions. So I'm a lazy guy, so I just use this polynomial feature, generates interactions for me. I just use what I want to, or what is useful, and leave everything out. 
So, selecting the best features is always a problem. You can do recursive elimination, so in every fold you can eliminate some features. No, not every fold, like the whole process. And it can also be based on model, random forest, XGBoost, these kind of models gives you feature importance. You can base it on that. Uh, or you can use select K-based or percentile from scikit-learn with mutual information or chi-square. But whatever you do, doesn't matter. It won't work. What will work is throw spaghetti on the wall and see what sticks. If your feature improves the model score, it's a good feature. If not, forget about it. Um, but how do we handle data when it changes shape? So right now, this looks pretty easy. So you have the card ID. This is also from a very recent Kaggle competition. And you have different features. And this looks like a date column. Probably a date column. And you have target. So, uh, this is another table that you're provided with. Now you can see like the card ID column has same values. Uh, well, it's not same. I'm showing only first five rows. But it means like every card ID has different number of data points. And then, then, there, then you have different other features like purchase amount, purchase date, state ID. So what you do in this case is you can create aggregate features. So you can take mean, max, min, or unique, these kind of aggregations. And uh, if you're a fan of pandas, like me, it's very easy to create these kind of aggregate features. So what I've done here is just I add, add, make this aggregate dictionary and I group by that aggregate. So I know like for month, I want to group by number of unique values and mean. And for purchase amount, some max, mean, variance, these kind of things. And you can, you can also just add your own function. And you can just add it here. And uh, Pandas will generate the feature for you, the aggregate feature. Uh, but what can we do when it's just one feature? So this is an ongoing Kaggle competition where the goal is to use seismic signals and to predict the time of failure in a laboratory controlled environment for earthquakes. So you have one training set, very large training set with two columns and one uh, and number of test files with 150,000 rows. So what you have in those files is only this column, the acoustic data, and you have the time to failure. This is only for training, not for test. Uh, but it's okay. No data, no cry. Don't work on it. It would be nice. But if you want to, uh, you can divide training data into chunks. And you have this, uh, since we have chunks of 150,000, so I'm going to use chunks of 150,000 for training. And for each chunk, uh, I can create a generator that gives me uh, acoustic data and the last label, last target, last time to failure. Once I have that, I can create features on the chunks. So I can just take mean, max, median, these kind of things. But one, um, there is one library that I really like a lot. It's called TS Fresh. And when you have when you have a time series problem and you want to generate a lot of features, I would definitely just go through all the features from TS Fresh and uh, then start feature selection from there. So then from there you can get number of features like absolute energy, count of mean, below mean. You don't have to calculate these features by hand anymore. Um, but uh, then we also have a case where we don't need culture. So that's text data. So 
you have here you have two questions i don't care about the ids and you have to say if the question is duplicate of each other or not but to handle text data there are many different ways or just for like creating features so you can start with some very basic features uh like length of question 1 2 number of words and blah 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 number of common words in the questions and when you have that uh this is how the features are generated so everything is one liner using pandas pretty cool uh yeah when you have that the next step would be to do some kind of fuzzy matching with similarity so it's also known as approximate string matching and the closeness of a match is defined by the edit distance so the number of primitive operations like deletion substitution uh insertion and it's typically used for spell checking plagiarism detection spam filtering these kind of things so fuzzy there is a package called fuzzy wuzzy which is very good and uh you can extract a lot of fuzzy features using fuzzy wuzzy uh so this is how you can from fuzzy wuzzy import first and then you have q ratio w ratio i've shown only four here um uh, john 7 and the other type of feature are tfidf am i going too fast too fast i cannot hear myself so So we'll just wait. So the number of times a term t appears in a document divided by the number of documents, total number of terms in the document, that's your term frequency, and logarithm of uh, number of documents divided by number of documents with the term t in it, that's your IDF. You multiply them, you get TF IDF. Very good. Works. Uh, this is from Scikit-Learn. I always use these parameters. I mean, I start with these parameters because they just work out of the box. Uh, probably you need to change stop words if you have some other language, or don't use stop words at all. Uh, then we have SVD, which is also known as uh, latent semantic analysis. So this feature is the decomposition on TF IDF features. So, what I usually do is take 120 components, or you can start with 60, 80, depending on how much you can accommodate in your memory. But more than that, it's not useful. And then you can create a number of features based on combination of TF IDF and SVD. So you have questions, get the TF IDF, combine them together, stack them. build the machine learning model or what you can do is combine the questions together get tf id of machine learning model or you can do something like this where you have svd on top of tf idf separate them, combine them together and this one both tf idf and then the decomposition or a single tf idf and then the decomposition the next ones are word to vec features so there are two layer neural networks uh they give multi dimensional word vector for every word in the dictionary or the corpus you have and they give great insights most of the time and very popular in nlp tasks so One of the examples is the Google News. So you have. So let's suppose every word gets a position in space. So.
so you have vectors for every word. And if you subtract Germany from Berlin, add France to it, you get a vector which is close to Paris. Quite basic, king, queen. Uh, then you have representing words and representing sentence using word to vec. So what you can do is you can use something like this, convert it to convert sentence to a vector instead of a word. So I'm taking all the words in the sentence, tokenizing it, using only alpha, uh, using only alpha numeric words, and uh, removing the stop words. Then I'm appending everything to a list, vectors for all all the words to a list and then I'm just normalizing it by count. Square. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm normalizing by square root of uh, the sum over the columns. So this is one of the methods of getting sentence vectors. Another one is doc2ec, you can use it. And once you have the word to vec uh, features, we have we have these vectors for every question, question one and question two. So you can calculate a lot of different kinds of distances from them. And all of this, uh, these are available in SciP. So once you have these distances, you have a lot more features. Another one is word mover distance. So. Word mover distance adapts the earth mover distance. So the distance between the two texts is given by the mass needed to move from one sentence to another. So here you can see like uh, Obama speaks to the media in Illinois and president greets the press in Chicago. These don't have any common words. So the cosine distance is one. It's not useful at all. but Word mover distance is pretty less. Uh, yeah, so speaks can go to greets and so on and so forth. Once uh, you have these features, so like for this particular problem, these are the different features that I had. And I had some more after word mover distance, normalized word mover distance. And all these distance features are based on what to work. I also added Q features and kurtosis. Uh, so now it's time to build machine learning models. So I went with two of my favorites, logistic regression and XGBoot. Five-fold cross-validation, I chose accuracy as a metric. I chose accuracy as a metric because this data set comes from Quora and their engineering team used accuracy as a metric when they first published the blog. So I thought I, it would just give me a chance to compare with them. Um, so this was, this was the result, like you can see the basic features give a pretty low accuracy on uh, logistic regression but quite good on XGBoost. But when I combine everything, I see like, okay, XGBoost has a very high accuracy, more than 80, 81%. So the job is done. I didn't try these variations because I didn't have enough RAM or patience. So it would have taken a lot of time. But it's the era of deep learning. So you need to have something on deep learning. So. I also used LSCMs, long short term memory, invented by Schmidt Uber, being used in text a lot, lot, lot. Uh, yeah, don't add a lot of LSTM layers. It's a type of RNN. And uh, it learns the long term dependencies between words in the sentence. Uh, I used two LSTM layers. And then uh, I also tried one-dimensional CNNs. So it's convolutional layer, one-dimensional. It's temporal, pretty easy to implement. So like this, here X is the input signal, H is the kernel, Y is the output. Sample length is the length of sample. 
and then we have the embedding layers which we have already seen so it converts the indexes to vectors and then the time distributed layer so what i used was i used a time distributed wrapper around dense layers and uh, it applies to every temporal slice of the input and along with that i used a lam lambda layer to make it more similar to SNLI model by Esmerity. Uh, so this was basic like implementation. I had the weights from Glove, so I don't need to it to be trainable. I use only 40 words. Uh, then yeah, the Glove embeddings. Uh, I use them as initializers for weights. Uh, the ones on common crawl because it has a lot of tokens. And uh, it's based on co occurrence matrix, so it's a dimensionality reduction of a co occurrence matrix. But we need to handle text data before training process begins. So there are several steps like tokenization, converting data to sequences. So you can fix the number of words. So I'm everywhere, I'm just using Keras, nothing else. And you have the tokenizer. So TK here is the tokenizer. You convert the data to sequences. And then you pad those sequences. And word index is just a dictionary which gives mapping from a word to an index. So next step is just loading the embedding itself. So there is, uh, it's just a file. So you load them in a dictionary. Every word has a vector and it's a dictionary, that's it. Then we can create the embedding matrix. So, which is always the number of words you have multiplied by, uh, sorry, times the size of uh, embeddings. And for every word in the index, you can get a vector. If it's not none, you can put it in the embedding matrix. If it's none, just ignore it. It's of no use. Or you can find a way to like, you can stem the word, you can spell correct the word, you will find more words. Uh, so this is how the final deep learning model looked like. So. I had a meme slide here which said it's huge. Uh, so let's break it into different parts. So the first part is the first model and it has embedding layer, time distributed dense layer and a lambda layer and this is how the model looks like. So model 2 is the same as model 1 because I'm doing it for each input question one and question two. Uh, the second part of the model is like this, the one dimensional convolutional model with some max pooling, dropout and dense layers. So I try to keep it very simple. And uh, this is the implementation of the model in Keras. So you can see like I'm using the old Keras API because this code, code was old, so. Uh, yeah, so you have the embedding layer. Here also I'm using globe embeddings and the convolutional and dense layers. And uh, in the end I have LSTMs. So embedding and LSTM layer. Here I don't use globe embedding, so I learned them. Uh, the reason was it just gave a good lift. And finally, I have a bunch of, I merge everything, put a batch normalization layer, and then a series of dense layers with batch norm, and preview activation, and dropout. And 
in the end, I had like 174,000, 174 million parameters in the model. I used a Titan X. And then I was just waiting for the model to train. The final results looked something like this. So this is for comparison here. And this network achieved accuracy of around 85%, which was near state of the art at that time. So, uh, near state of the art, like it was 88, I was 85, I was happy. So I published the article. And then uh, after, after a few weeks, Kaggle started a competition on the same data. So if I knew that, I wouldn't have published the article. So, but you can be more creative with text, text data. So you can, if it's a mix, you can do some kind of language detection. There's a lot of cleanup that you can do, remove special characters, numbers, stem, tokenization. Uh, you can use some synonyms to convert from one language to another and vice versa. You can do removal of stop words. So sometimes stop words are important, sometimes they are not. You can go for spelling correction, splitting of compound words. I won't go into details here. And you can also do some kind of named entity recognition. <coughs> well, I think my time is up, so uh, I'll just go very fast. But the idea is you should always start with some kind of fine tuning because it's faster and why do you want to reinvent the wheel when it's already there? So this is from one of the data sets that I worked on some time ago. So when I initialized the network with random weights, I don't, it's a binary classification problem. I don't get any kind of separation here. When I have pre-trained weights, <coughs> I can see like, I have some clusters, but when I use fine-tuned weights, so it was an image classification problem, I could see like it separates entirely. So that's the advantage. And here, just by using pre-trained network, I got a AUC of around 99, 0.99, which uh, was useful for winning that competition. Uh, the next thing you have is hyperparameter tuning. So you have different ways of doing it. Uh, if you're using Scikit-Opt or if you've heard of Scikit-Opt, you can create a classifier. So here I'm using CatBoost and then you can create a search space. So you can define whether iterations are integers or real numbers, they are integers. So we have integer here or we have real number. But if you want to take a deeper look, take a look at this repository. It's uh, from one of my friends, Luca, who presented it in Kaggle Days Paris. So it's quite end to end. <clears throat> Once you have that, you can just use by search CV and specify the search space, what kind of scoring method you want to use and the type of CV. So here I'm using stratified k -fold. I haven't shown that part of the code yet. Here, I'm using GP estimator. So that's also a hyperparameter, but this is something I, I don't like to do because this is, consumes a lot of time. Instead, I go for training uh, hyperparameter tuning by hand. And then if I have time left, then I can optimize it further. So this, like, this gives you a list of what kind of hyperparameters you should tune for every model. So like linear regression, you have the intercept and normalization parameters. Other parameters you can ignore, and it's my, just my opinion. Uh, so, like for XG boost, the list is huge. But the thing is, if you increase the depth, lower the learning rate, lower the column sampling, subsampling, so you'll be fine. <coughs> Light GBM, uh, that's something I don't like to use because. It has a lot of parameters. I cannot get my head around it. But the thing is, at the end, it's all about the sugar, understanding and exploring the data, spice, pre-processing, feature engineering, 
feature selection and all the good things which is combination of simpler models or a good cross validation thing and post processing and then you have chemical x which is i don't know maybe stacking blending models and that can give you a good machine learning model that you can used to probably win Kaggle competitions. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to finish. Thank you very much.